Hello. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you. Um, I think the only thing that surprised me about the photograph of Les in the kitchen, given everything he said up to um, just now, is actually he wasn't eating something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am um, I'm absolutely, this, my first presentation to industry um, was actually to the WIG Forum at Norwich in September. Um, I've spoken to industry a number of times since then, but I think actually since that event in early September, a lot of things have actually happened. Um, my views on um, the industry, it performs in some of the challenges, have actually really been, been crystallised. Um, I am absolutely delighted um, to be back talking to employee safety reps because I do passionately believe in the importance of workforce engagement. I've been given 45 minutes. You'll be pleased to hear I don't plan to talk for 45 minutes. Um, actually, one of the things I wanted to do today was to come and engage with you. So actually, whilst it's traditional um, for you to get to ask me questions at the end or during the panel session, um, I'm actually going to stop about halfway through um, my allotted time. And I've got some questions um, that I want to ask you, because actually I've come here today because I, really I do want to listen to you and to begin a dialogue um, with employee safety reps. What I'm going to talk about um, is uh, sort of four main areas. I'm um, looking at um, the industry safety performance, our approach to regulation and how that is going to be changing. Um, the priorities as I see them um, for industry and HSE going forwards and um, some thoughts I've got on how we might strengthen workforce engagement that I'd like to test um, with you. So looking briefly at industry performance, I won't spend too much time um, looking at this, but if you look at our performance over the last, last year and the last six months, or the first six months of this year, um, what you'll see is actually our reports of occupational ill health are fairly low. Um, our number of um, seven-day accidents and injuries, when you think of the size of the sector, are actually fairly low. And our, our dangerous occurrences, um, as you can see, are very significant and they, are, they contribute the most in terms of the failures in terms of safety um, on the offshore sector. Looking at the figures, I think it's a bit early to tell, but we're looking at probably about an 8% increase in dangerous occurrences over the year if the same trends um, emerge. And actually, you've heard Les talk already about what's the position is in hydrocarbon releases. So I have to say uh, we are looking, I think, at an increase in the number of dangerous occurrences. Looking at why we have, or the sorts of dangerous currency we're actually having, um, petrol hydrocarbon releases account for 31%. Um, offshore falls or fails, um, typically dropped objects, um, account for 25%, and well kick account for about 22%. So the majority of our dangerous currencies in the offshore sector are basically caused by three sorts of incidents. And we actually, when you look at our performance um, in the sector over the past four years, you see actually that it's the same things are, st are still challenging us. We haven't actually improved the performance in these three areas in the last four years. Now, I know we had the reduction in hydrocarbon releases over the last three years, but as Les has already indicated to you, the number of hydrocarbon releases reported to HSE this year have gone up very markedly. I think the, um, to, to the beginning of November, we'd had reports of 79 hydrocarbon releases compared to 56 in the same period last year. I, got, I ran the figures yesterday. The figures yesterday are we've had 92 reported releases against 64 in the same period last year. So we're looking at around about a 50% increase in the number of hydrocarbon releases just in the first seven months of this year alone. What I've done, um, and actually it's something that you, you'll, you'll, it'll be something nice for you um, when you go back to your offshore installations. As I wrote to industry yesterday, um, we, have, we have in the past written out to operators because they're responsible for the safety case um, and our focus has been very much on them. Um, I've taken the view that actually contractors um, actually employ about 85% of the workforce. They are the people, they're the people who employ, the people who are doing the jointing up, the maintenance, etc. So I have written to the contractors as well. I've, I've wrote to them through the OCA. I've written to the IADC and I've written to Oil and Gas UK. And what I've done is to challenge the industry um, on its performance. I've asked each of these organisations to write back to me, telling me what they're actually doing to improve occupational health, sorry, they're doing to reduce hydrocarbon releases. What I've also done is to point them in the direction of the step change guidance and all the step change tools, because actually we are, we, we, there's nothing new really in terms of hydrocarbon releases. We know the sorts of things. We've got some very good tools to help us. I think the challenge is actually are these things being properly implemented. So I've asked um, operators to come back to me. I've also asked um, operators to report all of their incidents on the CD database. 
which is a step change database, and there actually was a requirement from Maitland, the Maitland Review, um, to make sure that everybody in the industry sh shared, invest investigated and shared lessons. This information has been put on the CD database, and my expectation is the industry will actually do that. And Jake asked me, um, what am I going to do? How am I going to guarantee that um, people will actually do this? Because actually, I'm going to be looking at who's having hydrocarbon releases. I'm going to be looking at who's reporting on the CD database. And if people aren't reporting on the CD database, that suggests to me that actually they may be a target um, for the attention of some of my inspectors, more perhaps than some of the other operators who are actually reporting. So what actually has been the regulator's response um, to all of this? Um, this? I'm pleased to say this slide has developed. This is a slide I used for the last breakfast. Um, what was that, about a month ago, Liz? Um, what this shows is how many notices um, we've been serving offshore in the last three years. And I was struggling to understand the, why, why we've only served 15 notices last year. Especially when, actually, the number of times we've had to write to organisations, these are called issues. These are, we only write to organisations where you're not complying with the law. And when you look at the number of issues that we wrote to the offshore sector about last year, it was 700. We wrote about 700 times where we were finding very significant non-compliance with the law, and yet we only served 15 notices. Now, I haven't any feel, really, for what the ratio um, of notices to issues should be. Um, and, and, and actually, I do passionately believe that we need to, as a regulator, be responsible. But we've got to use the tools that are available to us. So what I did um, in June and July this year was we put every single inspector in Energy Division back through a three-day uh, training programme to look at investigations and what, what the expectation is in terms of investigations, also to look again at our enforcement management model and to look at the enforcement policy statement. And what we were doing was just refreshing um, inspectors' knowledge of where we were. I'm pleased to see, again, I got some figures wrong for me this morning. Um, I think in the first six months of this year, we had only served in the division um, seven notices, one of which was an, a, a provision notice. Since the training has been rolled out, um, in the last five months of the year, we've served 24 notices, eight of which have been prohibition notices. Now, what I've also instigated is a system where senior managers are reviewing these notices, so we're making sure we've got the evidence to support a notice. We're making sure that actually inspectors aren't rogues and they aren't scattering things like confetti. But actually, what we now have, I think, is a, a picture that I feel more comfortable um, with than I did um, certainly in the first six months of the year, where only seven notices had been served. Looking at issues, however, um, again running the figures, we are looking around about, this is the first six months of the year, um, if this pattern holds, then actually we will have written to the industry eight, about 840 issues. That's a 20% increase in the number of issues from last year. So what I see is a pattern of a 50% increase in hydrocarbon releases being reported and a pattern of a 20% increase and when we are having to write to operators and contractors to get them to confirm that they've actually, they're actually in, now in compliance with the law. Not a great picture. What are my other observations about the industry? Do you know what? I think it's absolutely great that every offshore worker will put a lid in a coffee cup and hold on to a handrail. What I don't understand is why the same workers, and in that I include not just the workforce, but actually the supervisors, the line managers, the OIM, and even perhaps some of the senior leaders in industry, will walk past a temporary refuge that looks like that. We'll walk past a temporary refuge that's got holes in the blast wall where you can put your fist through. This particular temporary refuge also required um, almost two men to close the actual door because it was so badly corroded. We've got workers who'll walk past this. Now, I don't know, I have to say, I don't know what this is, but it looks like a den that a tramp, <laughs> that a tramp has built. And that, that, really. And that's in, one of our, that's in one of our installations. This is in an industry somewhere that's investing £13.5 billion pounds in the industry alone, and that's what we can walk past, or what's what you walk past. I like this one. I could actually, you know, God bless the ingenuity of the offshore worker. So we've had a door that we couldn't shut. We've now got an emergency exit that doesn't open. So what you'll see um, almost in the centre of the picture is actually a lump hammer that's been placed there strategically. So actually, if we need to get out the emergency exit and we can't open it with our hands, we can, we can batter it with a lump hammer. But these are pictures that my inspectors have taken on offshore installations this year. And again, I quite like this one. 
This is a leaking actuator valve. Well, it could be anything that was leaking, really. So, actually, probably at some point, it was important that they got on with what they were doing. But two years later, it's become somebody's job to empty the bucket. Somebody's job to empty the bucket. You put lids on your coffee cups, you hold on to your handrails, and you, you walk past things like this, and you tolerate working conditions like this. I'm going to need some of your help to understand why that is. So what, again, what, does it, what am I doing um, within, the, uh, within HSE? I think I've been in HSE for 22 years, and I have a tremendous privilege, and it comes with huge responsibilities. And one of the biggest responsibilities I've got is to make sure that my inspectors go where they are most needed, and we will actually have the biggest impact on health and safety. What we don't have in the moment in offshore is actually a transparent way of any of my managers explaining to me why we're going where we're going and why we're doing it, and actually that that's having the greatest impact. So what I've decided to do with an energy division is to introduce the same system of targeting our resource that we've got in the whole of the rest of the hazardous installations directorate. It's what I'm used to forget with gas and pipelines, mines, explosives and biological agents. And it's quite a simple, um, it's quite a simple model, really. What, what, what we're going to do is actually look at the inherent hazard installations present, and that's based on the potential loss of life. And I'll, I can talk a wee bit more about that if people want me to. We're also going to look at duty holder performance at installation level and at company level. And then what we're going to do is to look at other operational intelligence. So things like the number of hydrocarbon releases are going up. Does that mean we actually need to target more the producing installations, etc.? So th those, all, all those factors will be brought together to, make, to help us decide where it is we're actually going to go. I had a very interesting conversation when I first started to float this idea around back past the industry. I went to meet, and I will, I will spare their blushes, but I went to meet one of the trade associations, and their response to me was, actually, this wasn't a tripartite issue. This was an issue that I should be dealing with the employers on, because actually the employers pay our costs. I have to say, I was absolutely staggered by that, because actually, where I come from, I'm the regulator, and I exist, because actually, we can't trust, society cannot trust or rely upon operators and contractors to look after and safeguard the safety of the workforce. So if you want to know why I'm here, I exist, because actually, we need to regulate in this sector. So from my perspective, engaging with elected safety representatives and with the trade unions on this was absolutely crucial to me and I have done that so I can give you assurance that the model that we've got has been consulted on with employee safety reps it's been to step change oil and gas UK IDC Jake and uh, John have the opportunity to look at this now it's not perfect I'm not going to pretend it is so I'll ask them to come up with something better because if there's something better believe me I'll have it nobody has been able to come up with anything better. So this model is the one that we are going to be using um, to, to, in future. But this has some consequences, and it's one of the things I want to talk to you about, because actually what this means is I am targeting my resource. At the moment, we've got a public policy, I, th I think, um, that says no installation gets left behind, and that means that we visit every installation every year. We won't be doing that in future. What we will be doing is actually focusing on those installations where the inherent hazard is the most significant and where duty holder performance is the poorest, because we have to. We have got to drag up the performance of the, weakest, the, the, performance of the poor, poorest performers, and we have absolutely got to be on the installations that actually where the inherent hazard that, where that's the greatest. That, and that, to me, is absolutely right. Now, it doesn't mean that there will be installations that never get inspected because one of the things we're going to do is to look at lapsed years so what we'll be doing is look, making sure that installations that haven't been inspected in one year come up the priority list for future years and that's just a sort of a, just to give you an idea of the sorts of levels of resource that we're going to put to what this also means is over time we, we, we're scoring duty holder performance on some key risk controls so things like competence asset integrity and what we're then going to do is to build up a picture of how an operator, and I can see Dave in the room, so I'm going to pick on BP. We're going, so an operator such as BP, we can look at their performance um, against a number of their installations, and we can start to identify the ones where the performance is the poorest. It'll be interesting to see if there's a correlation on workforce engagement and things like scores of 50 and 60, which are the very poor scores where, you're, where they're not complying. So what we'll do is actually we'll go back and challenge um, employers in terms of you, you, can, you can do it on installation C, you can't do it on installation D. Why is that? I need you to understand that. And oh, by the way, why is it the regulator that's telling you that? Why don't you have systems in place that tell you that yourself? Um, I think, as I said to you earlier, the, um, the, 
Our occupational safety performance is good in the sector. Um, you're actually far more likely to be injured. Oil and gas come in in the sort of amber colour band. Um, this is um, frequency of um, lost time accidents and injuries and ill health. And as you can see, you're actually more likely to be injured in the retail sector than you are in, in the offshore sector. So what does that mean, actually? So I've told you about where I'm going, but what does that actually mean in terms of what I'm going to be doing, what my inspectors are going to be doing when we go offshore? What that means is actually we are going to be taking, putting less effort into occupational health and safety. Because actually, for every other sector that HSE regulates, if your occupational health and safety performance looks like that, we are doing no proactive inspection whatsoever. But I recognise that in this sector, there are some areas of occupational health and safety that either impact on the major hazard side or actually are things that are, are particular and, and, and important to, to the sector. So what we're going to be looking at, our, our only proactive focus will be on heavy lifting, because you heard me say we've not made any progress on that in four years. We'll be looking at noise and vibration because actually that can have potentially quite a significant um, impact on asset integrity. It also impacts very much on workers, sleep patterns, fatigue, so a lot of human factors around there. So we will still be looking at that. And for some installations, we're going to look at asbestos in a proactive way. What, that, what we will do, however, is my inspectors will still engage with you if you have got matters of concern on any visit about an occupational health and safety issue. I would encourage you to raise that and we will deal with that. We will also deal with matters of evident concern. So if we see something, actually we think, you know what, that is outrageous, um, then we will deal with that regardless of whether it's on our agenda or not. We'll also investigate all complaints and, invest and mandatory um, investigations that are related to occupational health and safety. So where are we focusing our attention instead? Well, as I said, I think your major hazard performance is poor, your hydrocarbon release performance is deteriorating, and we are having to write to you too many, far too many times about issues that actually impact or say something bad and challenging about the major hazard performance of, this, of the sector. Um, I've been really struck, again, by the number of strategies. As I've said, I've been in HSE 22 years. I've, been, I've inspected every sector, apart from deep sea fishery, and there is no sector I've ever encountered that's got so many strategies and so many priorities. The HSE's regulator has got 14 to deal with offshore. Each one of my specialist teams has got a strategy. The pipeline strategy sits outside the main um, oil and gas strategy for the sector. We've got the step change work plan. Um, each company here will have its own, impro own improvement plan. So what I'm concerned about is actually we've got too many priorities. And it does one of two things. It either means that the well-intentioned can't focus on what really matters, or actually it gives those who are perhaps less well-intentioned an excuse to actually put their efforts into things that don't matter that much, but that makes them look busy. So I've been talking to um, Step Change, I've been talking to Jake, um, at Oil and Gas UK, IEDC, um, about what should, the main, what should we be focusing our attention um, on. And the areas I think we've concluded are around asset integrity, Hydrocarbon releases, and I want to take that out of asset integrity because your performance, or the industry performance is so poor at the moment. I want the regulator to give that, and industry to give that a particular focus. Workforce engagement, and I'm going to move on to the importance of that for me and what we're going to be doing. Um, competence, because it is a, an issue across the whole sector. It doesn't matter whether you're a contractor, the regulator, or whatever. Every, everybody faces challenges in terms of bringing in people with the right skills and keeping them. And also leadership, um, because actually... Um, I need, to, I need to see that people are at senior level and, including in this room, are actually active and showing visible leadership in terms of taking health and safety forward. I think it was Les that said earlier on, yeah, actually, everybody in this room is a leader as well. It's not just the people who sit in the boardrooms. So what we're going to be doing is looking at how we engage with, pe with people at different levels in relation to their leadership role as well. We talk about where I see workforce engagement now. I thought it was interesting, actually. Les has got a slide that has got um, somebody been pulled in about six different directions. I've just got you been pulled in two. Um, one of them's WIG, and the other one's WEG. Um, I, um, I find it strange. I find it strange, actually, that we've got two groups to deal with workforce engagement, and I think of it as engagement, not involvement, because actually involvement means you, know, you can come and, come and take part, whereas engagement means you're actually positively engaged in the room and, and part of describing the agenda. That's, that's what it feels like to me. Um, the, the industry seems to be hell-bent at the moment in diluting the effort it puts into workforce engagement. We've got no clear agenda. 
We've got two separate groups. We've got some people who sit on both groups. Is that really a good use of their time? Um, and there's a lack of clarity. So when I talk to offshore workers and people like yourselves about wigging wig, nobody knows what the individual agendas are if, unless they're actually at the, I sit at these meetings. And, nobody can, and lots of people I've been talking to can't see the point in having two groups. Um, I can't see the point in having two groups either. So as part of what I want to do, or what I'd like us to do as an industry to strengthen workforce engagement, um, is I would like us to merge the groups. I want a single agenda and I want joined up working. A wee bit about me and why workforce engagement is actually important to me. Um, my dad left school at 15. He went to work in the shipyards at Govan um, and he took, because they couldn't afford um, for him to stay on at school. But he did night school and he managed to, be, he became a teacher. He was also a labour councillor. So actually the rights of workers used to get argued in our house over breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, and that actually has, has meant and, and sort of reinforced in me the key role that the worker has, the, the need for engagement with the worker. I was talking to a couple of people from ENSCO um, during the break and I was saying, do you know what, the people in this room know where the shortcuts have been taken. You know the people that are taking them. You know the managers who are putting pressure on people to cut corners. You know when people aren't getting enough sleep when they come off the installation. So actually, I need you desperately to engage on this agenda with me. I need to engage the workforce. I need to engage you, because otherwise we are not going to improve this industry safety performance. I've had it suggested to me, um, I've heard some rumours, that actually what I'm doing is handing workforce engagement to Oil & Gas UK in a plate. Quite frankly, I find that insulting. Right? Between you and me, I find that utterly insulting. Uh, I have got no intention of handing over the agenda to Oil & Gas UK or any of the employers. We need to be working on these sorts of issues in a tripartite way. But I need to see you having a very key and leadership role. I've been talking to, um, to Les and Jake about whether actually, if we create one group, we could have that chaired by one of the elected safety representatives with the right sort of support. There's all sorts of ways of doing this. Be in no doubt, be in absolutely no doubt, what I'm doing here, what I want us to do is to work together on a single agenda. Yeah, absolute clarity, focus on priorities, no squabbling about who's sitting on what group or whose lead it was or who contributed to what to the Piper um, Workforce Engagement event. Actually, we, want, we need one group. And, and, and we need to do it quickly. And, and that actually has become my first priority for the industry, is to merge the groups. There's a meeting tomorrow um, where we're, we're bringing Wig and Wig together to actually look at what we do and how we do that and what the agenda is going forward. I want the, workforce, I want the worker representatives to decide what's in my strategy on workforce engagement. Now I've got some ideas, because actually I really like the new APITO training and the, people, the workforce representatives I meet who've been on that actually are really enthusiastic about it, understand the safety case, are saying they know more about major hazard risks now than their supervisors and their line managers. I haven't heard anybody be on that course and not take something hugely positive away from it. So one of the options might be, actually, do you know what, what's in our strategy? That we, all of industry needs to actually adopt this training and it's not done. You know, it's, it becomes mandatory training, which means actually it's paid for because it's mandatory safety training. It isn't paid for by workforce representatives. That's one of the ideas. I think the other thing I'm quite keen on is the workforce engagement tool. Step Change have put a huge amount of effort into developing a wide range of tools. One of the challenges we've got in this industry seems to be implementing them properly. So again, that's maybe something else that we could put forward in the strategy and get the industry to change. But these are just my ideas, and as I say, I really want to engage with you and with this new group that we form to determine what the agenda is for workforce safety, uh, workforce engagement going forward. So, now this is the part where I said I was going to hand over to you. As you all know, at these things, there is no such thing as a free lunch, a free breakfast, although I think some of you might be getting a free dinner um, later on tonight. So it's at this point I'm going to stop talking, and this will be much to Les and Jake's. Um, I bet they, they had probably had bets on me talking for a lot longer than this. Um, I'm going to move over. There's some question areas um, that I want, um, to, I want to explore with you, and it's all around some of the things that I've been talking to you. We won't have enough time um, to go through all of these questions, I don't think in a, in a lot of detail. I, I'm interested in getting some quick feedback um, from yourself. So when, we look, when I looked at the industry performance for up till um, November, we were seeing the hydrocarbon releases had gone from 56 to 79. I want to know why. I'm looking for your ideas on why that is, and I want you to talk to me now about what you think you can do to actually help reduce this. 
and I will pick on people because I know one or two faces if, I don't, if nobody speaks up. Terry. You say that the... Um, the um, you've mentioned the... I'm sure I'll come up in a minute. Sorry, yeah, you've mentioned that the, uh, the stats have gone up in the um, hydrocarbon releases. Is that because we're reporting more, or is it because we're including small releases, um, and does that also build into um, the asset integrity where the companies now, you know, with uh, the aging assets, they're actually doing more work on equipment that's failed, and so because of that, you know, we are having more spillages, but at the same time, they're actually trying to make good by replacing old equipment? Yeah. At the moment, we don't know, is the honest answer. Um, what I'm doing is we're working through both the Asset Integrity Steering Group, but also um, with my team um, to actually analyse um, the data, the reports that we're getting in, to see if there's a pattern in terms of it's, these are installations that have been brought back into production, so you would might expect there to be more leaks. Looking at the volume, as you said, the size, is there a pattern? Are we actually getting much better at detecting and reporting leaks um, than we have done previously? Um, there might be other reasons, you know, actually, uh, with my half glass, half empty face on, um, actually, maybe industry stopped reporting for the last two years in order to get to the target. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and I'm not actually, I'm not, I'm not, I am not, and, I'm, and I am absolutely not saying that, um, because actually what I'm do, we're also doing is looking at the people who are reporting. Um, we're looking at, and, and, and actually, I don't take the view that reporting means you're, you're a bad performer, because I am, with my experience, I am well used to dealing with poor performers who don't report. Um, so there, so that, yeah, but I think there's quite a lot of work we need to do in order to understand that. So the letter I've written out to industry um, talks about them having to investigate all their hydrocarbon um, releases for them to share those lessons um, with us. And as I said, the regulator is looking at releases as well and looking at the sort of, some of the underlying causes. I, uh, I think where I, <coughs> excuse me, where I work uh, on the GP3, the reason our hydrocarbon releases have went up is that I think they just got a bit too complacent. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is the unseeable things, the aging joints and integrity, but <coughs> the integrity thing, uh, generally, and it still happens, the first people when they need to bump anybody is the painters. Mm -hmm. That still goes on. Uh, and we used to do, like, at least once a trip, we used to do inspections with people for just various departments, get an area, inspect it just for fresh eyes. And because they were going down and down, they stopped that and it just got handed over to yeah. the OIE and maybe one other supervisor, which uh, reduced the involvement of the workforce. Yeah. And thankfully, they're bringing it back in now. We nothing they're here about it. Uh, Good. But, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why, where I am, mm. it's went up. Okay, thank you for that. I, I, actually, I would encourage you all to reflect on this because I, I appreciate that some of you might not know or might not have been aware um, of what was happening to the industry performance. But I would like you to go back to the installations and to think about what the elected safety reps might actually do um, to, to contribute um, to um, improving where we are and also actually to engage if, if operators are coming up with new systems or they're introducing new initiatives, um, then actually to, to try and crack the problem, then I would very much encourage you um, to you know, basically knock their door down and, and to engage. Uh, Colin Morrison from Aramark on Thank Nexon on. contracts. Uh, we're glad to hear that there's more, going to be more inspections and uh, looking differently through your, your colleagues. But what we might have wanted to have heard was that instead of reducing the annual visitations uh, and increasing your, your workforce, you, you're reducing the, the, work, uh, the inspection mm -hmm. but haven't increased your workforce to cover the additional works, which is too, too, too pronged. You're putting extra burdens on those that are actively working in the department and you are lessening your time on other platforms as well. A uh, couple of things. Um, we have been actively, 
I've been in hazardous installations for five years, and in five years, every head of offshore or now energy division comes to our management team meeting to say we've got problems recruiting and retaining staff. Um, and, and we have we got permission from Treasury against all the odds um, to give our inspectors a 21% pay increase, which actually you know, bust the, um, the public sector spending um, constraints. Um, so even with that, that increased salary, we were hoping we'd be able to attract more people in. We haven't been able to. Um, in the last month, we've brought three people in. Um, in the time I've been as head of energy division since April, we've lost 19 um, due to retirements and a small number of resignations. So whilst I would like us to have the number of staff we're actually supposed to have, I need to make sure that with the resource I've got, I'm actually putting that where it, it can have the most impact. And that's, what, that's why um, we're, we're going to adopt this approach. And would you not think that that might be the same effect in the oil industry as well? Uh, the inability to retain uh, yes. good quality men who have yes. moved further afield into other countries uh, and uh, not bringing in enough trainees mm -hmm. at an, an early enough stage before these guys mm -hmm. move on. I absolutely agree that there is a problem for the whole of industry. I, 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 sorry, I thought I'd said that. Yeah, actually, it doesn't matter whether you're a contractor or an operator or a supplier of serv any type of service or the regulator. Actually, we all face challenges in terms of um, keeping and recruiting um, good calibre people. <laughs> It's not something, that, again, that's why competence is on there in terms of this is, an, this is an issue not just for the regulator, but it's an issue for the industry to work together on to actually make improvements. I'll, I'll take two more questions on this because I've got some other questions I want to ask you too. And let, you'll, you will not thank me if you miss your lunch. Hi, Susan. This is just a, a suggestion on something that I did with Petrofac uh, on the Kitty Wake installation mm -hmm. years ago. I know what you're saying about companies putting strategies in place to, to counteract anything, but what we did on Katie Wake as safety reps was uh, review and audit the major accident hazards ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so we, yeah. we marked it up and, and we asked what mitigations were in place and we checked the mitigations were there. Mm -hmm. and, and it was an extremely, took a bit of getting going, but once yeah. it was there, it was a really, really useful tool mm -hmm. and the HSE you know, they could see it and it was impartial from us. Yeah. I think it's something that every safety rep, every platform could do um, from, from their point of view, rather than coming from the company, it could come directly from the rep. So they're, yeah. they're auditing themselves. Yeah. So just a suggestion for I, I everyone. think you, you, the people in this room actually <coughs> represent a tremendous asset for the employers um, offshore. Actually, what they need to do is to make sure you've got the training and the information to allow you to do the job that you could, act, you could actually do just in the way that you've described. You know, actually, they, if, you, if you think about it, if we, we put everybody um, who's an employee safety rep through the APITO training, the, 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 the major hazard module, just think of how many more pairs of eyes and ears that is offshore actually focused on the major hazard. So I like, I like your idea, and I would be, um, you know, that's the sort of thing that I think with this workforce group, um, I would be quite keen to see them put because this group will include um, your know, members of the trade associations, the operators, the contractors, the regulator, the trade unions, and actually if we sit in a room collectively and agree that that's what's important for this industry, then actually that's the standard that gets applied. It's what my inspectors will go out and inspect against. Thank you. Thanks. Just one more. Go for it. Hello. Sorry. Uh, I'm also I'm a, a safety rep, and I'm also an OIE offshore, and uh, we have a, an inherent problem with some operators. Now, I'm not saying that with the my current employer at the moment. However, the last <laughs> operator I did the work, did work for uh, had a fix on failure uh, purpose on, on uh, whenever they had a, any release of any kind of nature, and that seems to be quite uh, systemic in the, in the industry at the moment because of a, a lack of budgets to, to help along with, with painting and mm. a willingness just to, to nurse things along until the next shutdown. Yeah. Now, what concerns me is that the, the health and safety is, is diluted itself, as far as I can see, uh, and as other people have talked about as well, now that you become this uh, energy division rather than offshore division, mm. now you've, you've pulled in other resources. But the fact that you're saying that you're only going to visit the worst offenders. 
you know, it, it gives me a, a bit of grave concern because, you know, whenever any asset is visited by the HSC, although you put out a prior agenda for what you're going to come out and, and look at, you know, you can bite your bottom dollar that they're, they're looking at absolutely everything as soon as you step on that platform to make sure that everything is as should be, just in case you throw up a curveball. But now that you're not going to be visiting everybody, you know, there's the opportunity for operators to think, well, okay, they're not coming here, so, you know, we'll just leave that until next year, or maybe the shutdown and we'll be fine, you know. That's, that's, that's basically my main concern, and, and uh, I, I don't know what's your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, actually, you've like nicely led on to the, the question I was going to ask um, uh, the, on my next slide. A um, couple of things is actually, even when we tell them we're coming, and we tell them what we're going to look at, we can still find 840 things that we need to write to them about. So actually, they're not really that good um, at putting things right. You know, I, 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 <laughs> they aren't. Um, and on, on, I think on the, the other point, um, yes, I'm sure there will be some um, who might think, well, we're not going to do bits and pieces because um, HSE isn't coming. But actually, everybody's got a vested interest in producing safely. So I won't say, I, I don't, I, you know, anybody says to me safety is a number one priority and their employer, I don't really believe them. Actually, in this sector, it's producing safely because you can't afford downtime. So actually, there is an, there's an onus on um, operators and contractors to actually continue to do what they're doing. We have got an employee safety representative network. If you've got concerns about what's happening on an installation, significant concerns, and you can't resolve them at installation level, you, you, you know that we have got a complaints process. We're not going to reduce um, the number of complaints that we're investigating. In fact, actually, we're going to increase the amount of time we spend investigating from about 14% this year up to 30. Because actually, when, when there are gas releases or problems, that's actually when everybody's attention is much more focused on safety, and we generally um, get to the sort of the underlying causes and the things that will make a big difference. I have got to be put in my staff. It's not just the, um, the, the poor operators. What I said is actually we'll be looking at the installations that present the ha highest inherent hazard. So actually um, something like um, uh, Centrica, you know, high levels of H2S, that actually means automatically, it doesn't matter how good Centrica are, we're going to be going to some of their installations regardless because... Of, because of the fact that the inherent hazard of the installation is so significant. The other thing that will be t taken into account are things like uh, their asset integrity and the fact that somebody's sweating an asset that you know, is now 40 years old. So actually, a priority there would be looking at asset integrity and hydrocarbon reductions. We have just got to get the focus on the right things. I was horrified when one of my staff said to me, I'll be completely honest with you, one of my staff said, we go offshore and we do a general inspection um, before we start to look at what we came out to do. And I said, but you've come out to look at things because actually you've decided these are the, the important things to look at. Um, so actually, you need to go out and look at the things you think are important. And they said, yeah, but we can, when we do a general inspection, we always find other things. So actually, what I'm being told by that inspector is he goes offshore, he's decided what's really important, asset integrity, hydrocarbon reduction. He goes offshore and does a general inspection and he gets distracted before he's actually even started to do the th what he came offshore to do. We have got to get the focus right. It's not just the inspector's focus, it's your focus on the major hazard stuff, not so much the conventional health and safety. It's the operators and the contractors focus on that small list of key major hazard risks. It's not about coming out and doing everything. I think, this, and that, this comes back actually to what I was saying about um, shifting the focus. So actually us spending less time on occupational health and safety because that's where the, the, you know, the records show that your performance is good. Um, I think some people might find that quite challenging. So I'm interested in some feedback from you about what you think about moving away or focusing on fewer bits of occupational health and actually targeting much more on the major hazards, the asset integrity, the, the holes and the temporary refuge. I'd like to get some feel if you get any concerns about this. Or do you think it's the right thing? From my personal point of view is it's a good thing. You, you should be looking at the big stuff. The companies mm -hmm. themselves should be looking at, you know, looking after us individually as well. Mm -hmm. But from my point of view and the companies that I work for, it switches every two years between one minute they're looking at production safety, mm. are we keeping the stuff in the, the yeah. uh, pipelines? As you've seen, the, the hydrocarbon releases went down and suddenly it switched back to yeah. personal safety again. Mm. So at the moment it's personal safety, 
targets on the number of safety observation cards you put in, which two years ago we were told that didn't exist anymore. Yeah. Now it does again. It's getting used in people's appraisals and stuff like that. They've not put enough safety cards in. Um, a bit of consistency over a number of years would help, yeah. rather than every two years. A new OIM yeah. comes in, or a new area operations manager comes in, and he switches it back to the bit it was two years ago. Yeah. Because he's just got to change something. Yeah. I, I think that's a, that's a really, really, really good point. Um, and again, it's one of the other things. Um, you, the major hazard risks offshore don't actually aren't going to change very much. Okay, we might be moving into higher temperature, higher pressure, and that introduces some, you know, so there are some. So there will be some new challenges. But actually, the, the, the main things that we need to be focusing on to make sure you're all safe to make sure that there isn't actually a, ma a major incident offshore aren't changing um, from year to year. So what I want to do with this strategy is this actually is, uh, this isn't going to change. These are, these are the things that we're going to be focused on largely for the next three years. And actually, do I think we're still going to be looking at asset integrity in 10 years' time? I do, because actually, you know, we're going to be using, the, the installations will be getting older. So this, for me, is about what the constant agenda is. It's not about the initiatives. This is not just about HSE's agenda for the industry. I want to engage with oil and gas. I want to get oil and gas UK to buy into it. I've got step change. I talked at the step change planning event, and a lot of what step change were doing was actually focused around these themes. So, what is step change's contribution going to be to these key areas? I've shared it with IADC and Broa. Where I want to be is actually to get industry buy-in. So we've got one focus for safety. Now. It won't be that way because Conoco will get something from France, from Paris, that tells them that they've got to look at some things, um, or Chevron will get something from America. But actually, if we can keep the, the focus on these few core areas, then actually, for me, then we're all focusing on the right things, and that is what will prevent major accident hazards. And in relation to the... I'm getting driven, potentially, by... Um, our initiatives as well. So I was asked by my chief executive, my chair, what KP5 is going to be. And I don't want KP5. We're going back to look at KP1 to 3, because actually I need to make sure that industry performance has been sustained. So when we came and we looked, uh, and, you, and everybody improved, we then moved on to look at something else. I just want to see that when we've gone 1, 2, 3, 4, that actually performance on 1, 2, and 3 and still looks like compliance, because you know what? We decided those projects were important. And the, and the priorities for the industry to get right. So I don't think, if, if it gives you, provides you some reassurance, I don't think those priorities have changed very much. I just need to make sure that we keep our, the focus on it properly. Just very, very quickly, um, I don't know how much of you know about WEG and WEG and the individual groups. So I think what I'm interested in is, would you put your hands up um, for me if you actually think the idea of having one group to deal with workforce engagement, one agenda actually driven by uh, and, and supported by the workforce representatives and actually a focus on delivery um, and clarity. Would you put your hand up for me if you think that's a good idea? Thank you. Well, actually, what, what, what I will make sure is that tomorrow, when I meet with the members of Wigan WEG, um, I will say that we've spoken um, to the employee safety representatives and that the employee safety representatives think that one group, one agenda, is, and with them properly engaged, is the way forward. I think the last, the last thing I wanted to ask you really was, um, I'm looking for ideas, and, and I, we, won't, we won't cover it now, but I'm looking for ideas of how HSE can engage with you better as well. Um, I would be very happy to come here to every one of these meetings. I think actually, do you know what I would quite like? If the agenda at these meetings was actually driven by you, maybe a wee bit more, rather than it just being the regulator trolls up and gives you their perspective. If there are things actually that you want to use these sorts of events for, um, then please let us know. Because um, I think actually you, you, you get enough of being talked at um, by, in, in your, your company. So, actually, I'd like you to engage more in terms of thinking about what the agenda is, what you'd like to hear, how many of the safety representatives that you actually you want um, to, to come, up, come up and talk. Um, I think the other thing um, I'd like to say is um, if you don't get an email from me um, which gives you all the letters on hydrocarbon reductions um, that I've sent to all the operators because I'm sending them all to you. Um, it's taken a wee while to organise the email list, but you will see the letters I've sent to Oil & Gas UK, IEDC, the OCA and all of the main operators. If you don't get an email from me, or your colleagues don't, could you email me? I was, I'd actually asked Les to put my email address on, but I haven't got it. Um, but if you, I, you know, I'll leave it, I'll, I'll put it on, I'll make sure Les it's emailed to you, and give, give me an email back, so if you don't get the letters. Um, 
And I really want to finish off by saying a huge thank you to you all. Um, as I said, you know, I, I appreciate that for many of you, you this, you've taken your time out and okay, you're being paid and I'll hear the operators tell me, well, we pay them, but it's their downtime. So I appreciate the fact that you have come out today um, to, to uh, you know, and, and actually you're contributing, you're participating in the event. I do think it's really, really important that it, we get good turnouts um, for these sorts of events. I think it's really important that you network. I was really delighted to hear about what Marathon were doing in terms of actually bringing together elected safety representatives from across um, their business and across the companies that they use, because actually that's, 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 that's the power of, um, of what we do, isn't it? We bring different experiences. So a huge personal thank you um, to you all for attending and for also um, your efforts offshore to make the place much safer. Thank you very much. Thank you.